All right, can you hear me? All right, good morning. Uh, for anyone who saw my talk yesterday, I will try to talk a little slower this time. <laughs> um, so for those who don't know, I have spent a lot of time over the past few years thinking about VRF, virtual routing and forwarding, uh, specifically for Linux. Uh, we want an implementation that works across Linux, all, all installations of Linux, not just switches and routers, but servers as well. As a company committed to open networking, that's what we set about doing some 15, 18 months ago, was working on how to get a proper implementation into the Linux networking stack. So the initial implementation was pulled into the 4.3 kernel last August. And coming around nine months later, that, that version of VRF is beginning to show up in um, OS distributions. So for example, Ubuntu 1604 has VRF support enabled. And the intent of this, of this tutorial is to get people thinking about VRF and how it can be used on host servers. So, you know, I'm not one to, you know, really be hyperbolic about technologies and, and contributions and all that kind of stuff, but I really do think VRF on the host, it's gonna be huge. I guarantee it, it's gonna be huge. So the, the topology in question is a, is a typical uh, class, di uh, class topology where you've got two spines, four leafs, and some number of servers connected to those uh, spines and leafs. The host servers are running stock distributions like a 1604, Ubuntu 1604, and the intent of those is to host containers or virtual machines or um, some kind of microservices. So the, the hosts are connected to multiple leafs, giving an, an ECMP for a default route so you can you know, better use the, the bandwidth of the network. VRF, because VRF is in Linux proper, it, you know, it's, it exists, the same implementation exists in the spine, exists in the leaf, exists for the servers. So the same configuration can be used on all of those to set up and provide traffic isolation as you want to, as you want to do for your, your setup. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is what I'm talking about from a typical host deployment. You've got some number of containers. Those containers are gonna be isolated. In this case, we're gonna use VRF as an isolation. So we wanna allow containers within a VRF to be able to talk to each other. So anything within the VRF red can talk to each other. Anything in VRF blue can talk to each other. But the cross traffic doesn't happen, right? So VRF is that isolation mechanism. As we extend out to multiple hosts, same concepts. Every one of the servers, the leafs, the spines, they're all set up the same where they've got two VRFs, VRF red, VRF blue. Those VRFs provide the isolation so that containers running in one host in VRF red can talk to containers on another host in VRF blue, or in VRF red, um, and the network provides the, the connectivity for it but we don't want to allow that cross traffic between containers in blue and containers in red. So the spines and leafs are all running Cumulus Linux, of course. It's my favorite distribution, if you haven't heard. Uh, for this demo, it's using the Vagrant Box image, so that's, that's available from the, was it the HashiCorp website. I have made no modifications to that at all. You can download that, install it, and go. The spines have no routes. Those are strictly used as reflectors for the two pieces of the network. Because of the full implementation that we have in Cumulus Linux for VRF, the spine leaf config for Quagga can use BGP unnumbered. So the Quagga config for those two nodes is really simple. But this is the interesting part for this demo. This is where I want to get people thinking about um, VRF and what we can start doing with it on on the end nodes. So Ubuntu 1604 is running the 4.4 kernel and for the demo that I've got I have made no changes to that kernel. I'm strictly using what exists in that version of it. Other operating systems coming out with VRF support include Debian Stretch and Ubuntu 1610 which I'm hoping will migrate over to the 4.8 kernel. In terms of changes that I've made to this, it's really not 
changes to the kernel or changes to the OS, I've added on two things. One, I'm downloading the Docker experimental image. And the second thing is using the IF Updown 2 interface manager. Rupa gave a talk on that yesterday. When it comes to configuring and setting up VRFs, it really is the simplest uh, interface manager. It's got everything that needed, that's needed to configure the host to, to just work. So, as I mentioned, VRF support is, is what I'm going after. And for IF Up Down 2, it's as simple as the handful of lines in the interface config file. So, for example, auto red, iface red, give it a table ID. And in this case, we need to do some packaging change to get the verf helper into um, an add on package. But I have to manually add my static default route because I don't want lookups to fall from one table to the next. I have an unreachable default in all my verfs. And then to make interfaces a part of some verf domain, we just add verf, verf name to that interface stanza. In terms of the version of IF Up Down 2, the source code is available from GitHub. Uh, I'm using a lot of Top of Tree features, so I downloaded Top of Tree literally from this GitHub tree and built a dev package. I've added that to my uh, um, Ansible setup so that it's installing that version of IF Up Down 2, but anyone else can download that, that specific version and use it. And then IF Up Down 2, it works with Debian and Ubuntu both. I've, I've used it on all my nodes now. I've, I've removed IF Up Down and used IF Up Down 2. Haven't used it on Fedora yet. And then there's a, a link for using IF Up Down 2 on older versions of uh, Ubuntu. So yesterday, uh, Rupa got into some of the benefits of IF Up Down 2 and why it's such an awesome interface manager. And I wanted to give you an example. This is my actual configuration for Leafs, and it really highlights the, the power of the Mako scripting. So when, I'll talk about this in a minute, but the Leaf host um, setup has to use slash 31 networks to communicate since the version 4.4 does, uh, does not have IPv6 uh, link local support in it yet. We can't use BGP unnumbered. So I had to manually put up 31 addresses on all the interfaces. Using this Mako script, as I add more interfaces, I add more verbs, I add whatever at VLANs, just come in here, make a few changes, and all the interface config is generated. So very, very powerful tool. And then the same exact config can be used for every one of the leaves. I just change that one n equals number on the left side, and that same config file will plop onto leaf two, leaf three, leaf four. So let's focus on host networking. The Cumulus Quagga, or I should say, <laughs> for the host networking configuration, I'm using our Quagga, so routing on the host, downloading the Docker version of that because it's just the easiest to do the updates and to install and make sure it works everywhere. Uh, so I'm using that version as opposed to our dev packages, which are also available. As I mentioned before, I have an ECMP default route for each one of my uh, servers. So they have multiple routes to multiple leafs, and that's true for each one of the VRFs. The, the default route is learned by Quagga. So Quagga is configured to listen in verf red and verf blue. It talks to the leafs, it pulls down that default route and installs it in the verf tables. And then as I create networks containers on uh, a host, uh, Quagga on the host, so routing on the host again, it learns those routes from the host table and distributes it to the leafs and the spines. So the networking fabric, it just learns about the containers automatically. I don't have to do anything. Quagga running everywhere, it just works. And then again, of course, isolation provided by virtual routing and forwarding. Leaf host config. So VRF support in 4.4 kernel does not have IPv6 link local. So for this demo, I had to use, uh, like I said, slash 31 addresses on each one of the interfaces between the host and the leaf. So each VLAN sub-interface that gets put into a VRF uh, has a, a, a 31 address talking to, to its neighboring leaf. While I use Docker in this example, this tutorial, this, this setup, the configuration, it really works for any, any container technology, LXE, um, 
uh, KVM, whatever you're using to provide, even just straight up namespaces, whatever you're doing on a server, you can still use VRF in your host to, uh, to provide your isolation. All right, so looking at the first setup, this is a typical use case of, of Docker using the bridge driver. So you allocate a bridge within Docker, you give it an address subnet, and then you start spinning up uh, containers on that, uh, on that bridge. So the only thing I've done is come in after I've created the Docker bridge, I have a script that comes behind it and says, oh, this bridge goes into this VRF. So I just set the master on it after, the, after Docker's done its initial setup. So here's an example of what the VRF route table looks like on a host. So at the top, we have our ECMP default route to both of the, the leafs. These are the slash 31 addresses. And this is, again, the VRF red um, uh, table. So you've got a connection to leaf one and a connection to leaf two. VLAN 10 is what, so, so VLAN is providing the trunking over those interfaces. And VLAN 10 is assigned to the red, 20 is assigned to the blue. So in this case, I have two bridges. I've created two networks, two Docker networks within this host. And slash, 24, or slash 28 uh, addresses for those bridges. And the first time I create a container, the, the, the link up happens and those routes are uh, visible in not only the host, but then gets distributed out to the leaf and spine. Inside the container, the networking is fairly, uh, fairly simplistic. It has an address. It uses the host as its default gateway. So not much knowledge is inside the container. So here's an example of the fabric learning uh, one of the routes as I start up a container. So in this case, it's host 41. I started up a container in the first set, so on the first bridge. And it's in verf red because of uh, the one. And again, when I started that container on the host, the spine learned it automatically. And I guess you'll notice also, I have management verf running on all the nodes. I can't get management verf running on the server yet until we figure out how to do the verf helper for setting uh, verf context. But we'll get there where management verf can be running on all the nodes. The second uh, configuration for the Docker networking is using VE pairs and then slash 32 routes in the host. So in this case, I'm using the Docker driver for none. So no networking config is set up at all. And I manually come behind it and create a VE pair. I drop one end into the Docker container, put the other end into the VRF, and then manually assign the slash 32 address within the container and insert the host route into the host table. So one limitation I have with VRF in the VRF 4.4 is um, there's no locally originated traffic to local addresses. So you can't, for example, give it like with the, the bridge example where it's using the host IP address. I have to go straight out to the leafs for the default route. That is something that's gone in 4.8, so that's why I'm hoping these OS distributions will quickly move to something like a 4.8 kernel. So in this case, my host uh, verf table looks like this. Got again the default routes coming from the leafs, the connections to the leafs in each, in each verf, and then this is an example of a single container host route in the host table. So I don't have the entire subnet, I can have a specific host, specific address. And so if that container were to move to a different host, if it kept that same address, the network would learn that it moved from host 1.1 to host 31, for example. This is what the container route looks like. So again, it's unfortunate that the limitation in 4.4, it's that evolution of getting an implementation to be you know, fully complete. I have to pass that default route from the host into the container, but with that one workaround, it all works. So again, to emphasize what can be done once we get to that 4.8 kernel for the host OS, this is a different VM running Docker, and it shows that I can use that typical slash 32 
inside the container. It's able to use the host gateway address. And again, a very simplistic uh, config for the containers and everything just works. So this, this demonstration, it uses Vagrant for container orchestration, Ansible for configuring all of the nodes. I have put the entire config of, on my GitHub tree. No, nothing fancy is needed. Everything that's, uh, that's being used for this, you guys have a, a access to, be it our Cumulus VX image and the Ubuntu 16, 1604 image. That's also available as part of a Vagrant box. IF up down two code is available, our Quagga is available. So essentially, if you wanted to try out this demo, clone that site, Vagrant up, off you go. All right, so at this point, I can switch over to, uh, good night. All right, let's see what I can do on making this readable but usable. Is everyone in the back, can they still see that top window okay? So this is IP monitor running on the spine. So that's one of those, the, the network nodes at the very top. Uh, I have a shell script that I can run from my server so I don't have to actually log in and access each one of those, those hosts because it does get a little overwhelming having to deal with each one. So in this case, just to show you, this is host one, and it has three containers running. So two containers running in the two different bridges for verf red, one container in verf blue. So I could start up another container in verf blue on host 11 container one. So let's do that and taking a look at the, the spine and monitoring routes. So this command is just using Ansible to log on to host 11 and run the Docker command that actually spins up. And you can see, as soon as that container came online, so this one's attached to, so I guess I should back up and say, I have all the odd number hosts using the bridge Docker config, and I have all the even numbered hosts using the uh, VE pairs and slash 32 routing. So in this case, I started up a new container on host 11 connected to the bridge, so that's why it has the, the slash 28. So if I were to do the same thing on an even, and I guess I need to figure out what host doesn't have one started. Okay, so host 12 does not have a container in blue in the second set. And so again, this one is gonna show up as a slash 32 route. And so there you go. So the network is automatically learning whatever's being done on the host because we have Quagga on the host running and the whole network's, you know, the, 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 the Quagga is distributing those routes. So I guess at this point, are there any questions? This all just seems straightforward and Standard networking config. It's huge. Huge. <laughs> All right, well, does anybody want to see anything in particular, like the, the VRF isolation? All right, I guess it's so, so obvious that <laughs> I'm up here explaining simple things to everyone, so, okay. Oh, that, that thing is your isolating network. Yeah. <laughs> You're isolating the network, but you still have the ability in the container to access the other verfs if you stand on your head. Uh, they're still visible and everything else versus a network namespace where they're not visible. 
Uh, they're visible if you have access to the host, yes. Just like the namespaces would be visible if you had access to the host. The thing is if I run um, an IOCTL to show me the interfaces in, yes. a, in a container and I'm using network namespaces, I'll only see the, inter I'll see, only see the interfaces in that namespace. If I use VRFs to do it, I'll see all the interfaces. That's, I mean, it's just a difference in semantics that may or may not. So if you're matter. inside the container, you can't see anything. That was the whole point okay. of, what's that? Okay. Yeah, so inside the container, you see a very simplistic network config. You don't okay. see anything about the host. You have no idea that you're okay. running in one red, or ver, one verf versus another. All of that is inside of the host and inside okay. the network fabric. Oh. Well, since you're bored, nobody wants to ask questions. <laughs> so you're using Ansible as the orchestration system? You yes. Would it, for fun or? I'm sorry? Is for it just fun. for fun or why are you using Ansible for this? Uh, because it's awesome. It's automation capabilities. I did not want to go through and configure uh, eight hosts. Right, but you see a data center guy using Ansible for this. I'm sorry? In a big data center, do you see anybody using Ansible to do this? Uh, definitely. People are using automation all the time now. Yeah, that's, I'm, that's I'm, I'm building containers all the time. I'm just going to sit there and type Ansible commands. I know earlier I was going off about orchestration tools, but really yeah. if I had to go configure 14 hosts or 14 network nodes, right. you know, I'm going to use something like uh, Ansible to log into each one of those and do it. For creating containers? Uh, sure, for creating containers for whatever. Okay. Right, and, and for me, this is just what I'm doing for my network setups and my, for my demos. I can see for the demo, yes. But yeah. In a, in, in a, do you see something like, uh, what's that Twitter thing? Uh, Mesos? Or? Sure, uh, different orchestration tools, right? So what I'm really getting at here is the host config, and because you know, we're all using Linux. The switches are running Linux. The host is running Linux. Uh, because we worked with, you know, the, the community to get um, networking features into the kernel, everything can be done the same. There's no reason to treat a server any differently from a switch. Agreed. And in here, you know, being able to use Vagrant or, or Ansible, rather, to log into each one of those nodes and do easy config, using IF up down 2, for example, to, to generate easy config for the the interfaces. I mean, that's that's the power of what we're trying to show. So, so um, <clears throat> I, I think I know what he's really asking. So, so the question that is on the table is, why would you do Ansible for container orchestration? And that's not the point here. This is Ansible to do the network configuration part of it. It happens oh, to be yeah. that he's using Ansible to launch the container because we already have yeah. the inventory and it's easy. But we are not. There is no proposal or position oh, no, no, from no, no, about you. use Ansible to do container orchestration. Yeah, no, I was not proposing to use Ansible for the container orchestration. I was doing that out of, before I, w I had screen windows logged into all the different nodes and manually spinning that up. And I'm like, what a pain. Ansible will log in all these hosts for me. I wasn't going to ask about eBPF. But... You were going to ask about eBPF? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let me go add that to an extra slide here because it is also going to be huge. <laughs> huge. All right, any other questions? Awesome. I look forward to seeing VRF showing up everywhere. <laughs>